This lecture is part of an online course on Galois theory and will be a sort of review of field extensions. So we just recall that a field extension just means two fields, one of which is contained in the other. So K and L are going to be fields. And this is sometimes denoted by L over K for some reason. And we, Galois theory is mainly about the study of fields, but it turns out to be really useful to study pairs of fields or field extensions. And the reason for this is that if we want to study a field L, um, it's quite often useful to sort of build up to it by starting with a smaller field L naught and building a chain of bigger and bigger fields until we reach L. And, and then we sort of prove things about L by starting with L naught and kind of hopping up one field at a time. So, so we need to study field extensions in order to be able to do this. So here are some basic examples. Um, we can have the rational numbers contained in the reals. So this is rationals and this is the reals. And the real numbers are contained in the complex numbers. Uh, so these are two standard examples of extensions. Um, if we've got an extension, we define the degree of the extension L over K. Um, is th this degree is denoted by L K in square brackets. I have no idea why. And this is just the dimension of L as a vector space over K. For example, the degree of the complex numbers over the reals is just two because the complex numbers form a two-dimensional real vector space. And the degree of the real numbers over the rationals is infinite because the real numbers are an infinite dimensional vector space over the rationals. Um, if you're sort of set theory type person you 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 know that there are that this symbol infinity is actually kind of a bit sloppy because there are lots of different infinities in set theory and you can ask which you know is is, is this a countable infinity or an uncountable infinity and so on um we don't really care um galois theory is mostly about finite extensions and if an extension is infinite it's pretty much out of reach no matter what sort of infinity it is so we won't worry about that. Um, so um, the extension is called finite. So the extension L over K is called finite if the degree is finite. So for instance, the complex numbers are a finite extension of the reals. Um, now, um, suppose we've got an extension K contained in L, and we've got some element alpha in L. Alpha is called algebraic over K if alpha is the root of a polynomial P of X with coefficients in the field K. Um, alpha is called transcendental over K if it's not. Uh, transcendental has nothing to do with any religious meaning of being transcendental. Um, and if it's algebraic, um, there's a smallest irreducible polynomial that it's a root of, so the degree of alpha uh, is is the degree of uh, is the smallest degree of uh, of a polynomial p, and if if alpha is transcendental, I suppose you could say it as degree infinity if you like, but I don't think people use that much. So let's see some examples. Let's take k to be the rational numbers. Um, if you say if you talk about a number being algebraic or transcendental without specifying the field, then you usually mean you're working over the field of, tran of, of, of rational numbers. Um, so if we take k to be the rationals, you can look at say the number alpha, which is a fifth root of two, and this is obviously algebraic because it's a root of x to the five minus two equals zero, and it has degree 
5, because this polynomial has degree 5. Um, if you look at the numbers pi or e in the reals, then these are transcendental. Um, this is sort of difficult to prove. So um, Ermate um, proved e was transcendental back in the 19th century, and Lindemann proved that pi was transcendental a few years afterwards. And um, th this started off a large, huge theory of transcendental numbers where you try and prove various numbers are transcendental. Well, th these are rather difficult examples of transcendental numbers. So, so let me give you an easy example of a transcendental element of a field. If you look at the field Q, it's contained in the field of rational functions over Q. So you remember that rational functions are going to be any polynomial divided by any other non-zero polynomial. And now you notice that x is transcendental over the field of rational numbers. Um, and here's an example of a number where it's not perhaps immediately obvious whether it's transcendental algebraic. What about the number cosine of 2 pi over 7? Is this algebraic or transcendental? And so if you didn't know about it, you might sort of guess it's transcendental because cosine is a very transcendental function and pi is transcendental and so on. But it's actually algebraic. And one easy way to see that it's algebraic is to notice, that let's call this number alpha. Alpha is equal to zeta plus zeta to the minus 1 over 2, where zeta is a fifth root of unity, e to the 2 pi i over 7. So let's just draw a picture to see what's going on. If we look at the unit circle, um, then um, you can look at the seventh roots of unity, and you know, you, you, you know that they they all lie on the unit circle in the complex plane and form a nice regular seven-sided polygon. And um, zeta is going to be this one here. It's traditional to use zeta for roots of unity. So, so we know zeta to the seven is equal to one. Um, and alpha is going to be just this point here. Um, so you recall from Euler's form that this is cosine of 2 pi over 7 plus i times sine of 2 pi over 7. Um, well, this isn't actually irreducible because it's got a factor of zeta minus 1. So um, we can um, find an irreducible polynomial with the root of zeta by quotient out by that. And we find 1 plus zeta plus zeta squared plus zeta cubed plus zeta to the 4 plus zeta to the 5 plus zeta to the 6 equals 1. And now from this, we want to find an explicit irreducible polynomial satisfied by alpha. Well, let's divide this thing by zeta cubed. So we get zeta to the minus 3 plus zeta to the minus 2 plus zeta to the minus 1 plus 1 plus zeta plus zeta squared plus zeta cubed equals 0. And now we notice that 2 alpha cubed can be written as zeta to the minus 3 plus 3 zeta to the minus 1 plus 3 zeta plus zeta cubed. And what we're trying to do is to express this in terms of alpha. So if we look at 2 alpha squared, then it's 1 times that plus 2 times 1 plus 1 times zeta squared. And if we look at 2 alpha, it's equal to 1 times zeta to the minus 1 plus 1 times zeta. And 2 alpha to the 0 is just equal to 1. So um, if we take the linear combination 2 alpha cubed plus 2 alpha squared, that will give us 1, 1, um, 3, 2, 3, 1. And then we can, um, if we subtract 2 times 2 alpha and then subtract um, um, 1, you see this is equal to zeta to the minus 3 plus zeta to the minus 2 and so on, all the way up to plus zeta cubed, which is equal to 0. So, so here we found an, 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 a polynomial satisfied by alpha. So it's 8 alpha cubed plus 4 alpha squared minus 4 alpha minus 1 equals 0. So here's a, here's a polynomial 
with alpha as a root and it's got rational coefficients. Um, by the way, you might wonder what the other roots of this polynomial are. Well, that's not very difficult to see because you can do the same thing with zeta squared or with zeta cubed. So you find the other roots are going to be cosine of 2 pi over 7 times 2 and cosine of 2 pi over 7 times 3. Um, and in case you're wondering why you don't get cosine of 2 pi over 7 times 4, the answer is you do. It's just that cosine of 2 pi over 7 times 4 is equal to cosine of 2 pi over 7 times 3. So, um, um, uh, so, so next we observe that there's this simple criterion. Suppose we've got a, for a number to be algebraic, suppose we've got two fields k and m, then alpha in m is algebraic over k if and only if alpha is contained in a finite extension of k. And this is very easy to prove. Let, let's first suppose that alpha is in a finite extension Um, L, well then we have L over K will have degree N less than infinity for some N and now all we do is look at 1 alpha alpha squared up to alpha to the N and what we notice is that these are N plus 1 elements of an N dimensional vector space over K. So there must be a linear relation a non-trivial linear relation. So we have a naught plus a1 times alpha plus plus a n alpha to the n equals zero. And this just is a polynomial satisfied by alpha, so it implies alpha is algebraic over k, of course. Um, on the other hand, uh, we want to show that if alpha is um, in a, if alpha is algebraic, then alpha is contained in a finite extension. And for this we first recall um, a way of constructing finite extensions, which is suppose p of x is an irreducible polynomial in k of x. Then um, we can form an algebraic extension. We take the ring of all polynomials over k and we quotient out by the ideal of all multiples of p. So then this is a field. Um, well, it's, it's automatically a ring. Because if you take any ring and quotient out by an ideal, then... Um, that's always a ring. I, I guess I should have said commutative ring, but whatever. So the problem is existence of inverses. In other words, if we've got an element of this ring, does it have an inverse? Well, suppose we have some um, element qx in kx over p with q not equal zero in this. This means that Q and P are co-prime in K of X because P is irreducible. And we're assuming Q is not equal to naught in here. That means Q is not a multiple of P. Um, you should recall that the ring of polynomials over a field is um, a Euclidean domain and a unique factorization domain. Now, since it's a Euclidean domain, since these two elements are co-prime, we can find polynomials ax times q of x plus b of x times p of x um, such that this is equal to 1. And for do this, we use the Euclidean algorithm. As in a um, basic ring theory, which is supposed to be a prerequisite for this course. And now if you look at this, it just means that a of x is the inverse 
of q of x if p is equal to naught, so in, in k of x over p of x. So, so elements of this ring have inverses, and you can actually find the inverse using the Euclidean algorithm for polynomials, if you like. Um, so let's get back to what we are trying to show. We're trying to show that um, if alpha is algebraic, this implies alpha is in a finite extension of k. So, um, well, alpha is algebraic means that alpha is a root of px um, in k of x where p can be assumed to be irreducible. Um, so all we do is we look at the field k of x modulo p of x, and this is contained in, so this contains k, and it also contains l. And now we can have a map from this field to l, which just takes x to alpha. And it's well defined because alpha is a root of this polynomial p, which makes it easy to extend, which means that the map from k of x to l um, um, vanishes on p of x. So the image of k of x over p of x in l is a field containing alpha. And furthermore, we see this field um, has dimension um, is equal to the degree of the polynomial p over l, so it's a finite extension. So this is a finite extension of k. So this shows that um, not only are elements of finite extensions algebraic, but that algebraic um, elements are always contained in finite extensions. Um, so next, um, we ask, how does the degree behave if we've got a tower of extensions? So, as I mentioned, we're going to spend a lot of time working with long towers of extensions, and we want to know, um, what's the degree of m over k? And it's equal to the degree of m over l times the degree of l over k. So the degree is multiplicative in extensions. And you can ask why. Well, this is very easy. What we do is we pick a basis x1 up to xm of L over k, where m is equal to L over k. And we pick a basis y1 to yn for m over L, where n is, of course, just the degree of m over L. And then we check that the numbers xi, yj for 1 less than root to i less than root to m, 1 less than root to j less than root to n, form a basis for the vector space m over the field k. And I'm not going to carry out this check because it's very easy. You can do it as an exercise or something if you want. Um, that the main thing we're going to use uh, in, the, in, in the next few minutes is that, in particular, if, if this extension is finite and this extension is finite, then this extension here is finite. So we, we only need a very special case of this, although we'll be using the full result later. So now we're going to show that if alpha and beta in some extension L are algebraic, over k, then so are alpha plus beta, alpha times beta, alpha divided by beta, and alpha minus beta. Provided beta is non-zero, of course. Um, this isn't completely trivial, so let's look at the following example. Suppose we look at the square root of 2, well that's algebraic, and the cube root of 2 is also algebraic, and the fifth root of 2 is also obviously algebraic, but if you add them together and try and find a polynomial of these as a root, you probably won't be able to. 
um, unless you're extremely persistent or have a big computer. That's because the smallest polynomial over the rationals with these three numbers as a root has degree 30. So it's not immediately obvious that the sum of two algebraic numbers is algebraic. It's not so easy to write down an explicit polynomial with this as a root. So we can say this is algebraic, but maybe not immediately obvious that it's algebraic. Well, here's, here's one way to see that this is algebraic. What we do is we look at the field K, and it's contained in the field K of alpha, and this is going to be a finite extension. So this means the um, smallest subfield containing K and alpha, which has as alpha is algebraic, this is some finite extension whose degree is the degree of alpha. And then this is containing the extension k alpha beta. Uh, because beta is algebraic over k, so it's certainly algebraic over k of alpha. So this is also a finite extension. And the degree is less than or equal to the degree of k of beta over k. It might actually be less than this because um, um, beta might satisfy an, will satisfy an irreducible polynomial over k because it's algebraic, but this polynomial might become reducible over k of alpha. So, so this degree here might actually be a little bit less than you expect, but this doesn't really matter. The point is, this extension is um, these two extensions are finite, so this whole big extension is finite. And what this means is that Anything in this extension is finite over k and therefore algebraic. So this contains alpha plus beta, alpha beta, and so on. So alpha plus beta and alpha beta and so on are all, all algebraic. I just remind you that although this proof looks almost trivial, if you actually try and unravel it and find the polynomial explicitly, you suddenly discover you're doing some rather tedious and messy linear algebra. Um, there, there's a similar result we can, where, where we can show that if alpha is a root of a polynomial with algebraic coefficients, that this means, um, again, we're, we're, we're working over a field K and alpha is in some field L. So then alpha is algebraic. Um, and what this means is so if alpha to the n plus a n minus 1 alpha to the n minus 1 and so on plus a naught equals naught. And if all the a i are algebraic, this implies alpha is algebraic. Well, we can prove this in a very similar way to, to our proof that the sum of two algebraic numbers is algebraic. So all we do is we take our field k and we look at and then, then we adjoin a naught, and then we adjoin a naught and a one, and we go all the way up to k a naught up to a n minus one, and then we adjoin k a naught up to a n minus one, and and at this point we do something a little bit different. We we, we adjoin alpha, so I'll write alpha in fluorescent pink to to remind you that that's not a n, and all these extensions here of finite extensions. That's because we assumed all the AIs are algebraic. And this extension here is finite. And the reason this is finite is because we've got um, a polynomial satisfied by alpha with roots in this field. So just as before, we see this big extension here is finite. And since alpha is now in a finite extension of k, we see that alpha is algebraic. Um, so let's see an example of this. Um, so um, we showed that e and pi, well, we mentioned that e and pi are transcendental. Um, it's a very hard open problem. Say, is E plus pi transcendental? I mean, everybody believes it is. Um, it'd be 
it's really astonishing if it wasn't but but proving it's transcendental is seems to be beyond what transcendental number theory can do at the moment we can also ask is e times pi transcendental and again this is an incredibly difficult open question um, Okay, the answer to both of them is probably yes, but nobody knows how to prove it. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve one of these. So let's have a theorem. E plus pi or E times pi is transcendental. And the proof of this is almost trivial. What we do is we look at the, 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 the polynomial x squared minus E plus pi x plus E times pi. And the roots are obviously e and pi. Now if e plus pi and e times pi are both algebraic, this implies the roots, this implies the coefficients of this polynomial are algebraic, so this would imply the roots e and pi are algebraic. Well we know they're not by Hermite and Lindemann's theorem, so, so e plus pi and e plus pi can't both be algebraic. So here I've got two impossibly difficult questions, almost impossibly difficult, but I can answer one of them. I, I just don't know which of them I can answer. Um, actually, the, 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 there's a sort of slight logical problem here. Um, the, the, there's a um, philosophy of mathematics called intuitionism, which says that if you assert you've proved either A or B. This means you've either proved A or you've proved B. And an intuitionist would deny that I've proved that one of these two numbers is transcendental because I, I have no idea how to prove E plus pi is transcendental and I have no idea how to prove E times pi is transcendental. So an intuitionist would say I'm not allowed to assert that, that I've proved that one of these numbers is transcendental. But whatever, in, in classical mathematics, I've proved that at least one of them is transcendental. OK, that's um, enough for the review of um, extensions and algebraic numbers. The next lecture will be on splitting fields of polynomials.